join me in welcoming Imri to the stage. Okay, so hello everyone. As Monty Python would say, now for something completely different. Um, my name's Imre Bard, and I'm really thrilled and excited uh, to be here. It's sort of a difficult challenge to speak at the end of such an awesome and rich event as this one, because so much has already been said, and I assume a lot of you are already kind of exhausted from these two days, and also there might be a lingering expectation that the last talk somehow has to be pretty cool. So please bear with me as I try to share with you some bird's eye view reflections and ideas about augmented reality and virtual reality, maybe from a slightly different perspective than the previous few talks. Uh, and I would like to relate it back to the overarching theme of the event, which is superpowers to the people, which is something that I can really relate to because over the past uh, three years, I worked on a project that was funded by the European Commission and it was looking at human enhancement technologies. Our mandate was to try to facilitate societal dialogue about the ethical acceptability and the social desirability of human enhancement technologies, focusing in particular on neuroenhancement. And neuroenhancement is this umbrella term describing a variety of technologies that could be used to in influence and enhance, in particular, cognitive, affective, or behavioral functioning. And this is a really hot and exciting topic at the moment. There is a lot of interest and a lot of investment pouring into neuroscience as we try to understand how the brain works and to find uh, cures for diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other neurological and psychiatric conditions. But there is also a, a hope, or at least a vision, shared by a lot of people that the fruits of this research will also prove beneficial to people who don't have any neurological or psychiatric conditions, um, and that we might be able to enhance and improve upon healthy, normal cognitive functioning. So if you look at the news on any given day, you might read about um, Generation Adderall and the rise of uh, the use of purportedly cognition-enhancing smart drugs among students, or the necessity to come up with a legal framework to somehow regulate uh, neurostimulation devices, the use of neurostimulation devices in medically unapproved contexts, or the idea that bionic implants and bionic prosthetics will soon become so powerful that they reach or maybe even surpass the functionality of original biological limbs. So having spent a few years uh, thinking about these topics and being immersed in these discussions and participating in them, it struck me that while we spend a lot of time thinking about the potential future consequences of these biotechnological innovations, there is this whole area of anticipatory governance where we try to think about what future scenarios might emerge and what problems, what ethical and societal considerations those developments raise. We don't really spend so much time doing the same for augmented reality or virtual reality, even though we can recognize that they might have really profound impacts and, and a profound influence on people's self-perception, on their relationships with others, and that is just an area that somehow is not as explored or as intensely discussed as uh, biotechnological innovations. So that was one really interesting uh, recognition from, from, from this work. And another one was that the debate or the discussion going on about enhancement technologies is somewhat limited, one might say even slightly impoverished, because the focus seems to be on technologies that can improve and enhance productivity in an economically valuable uh, sense of the word. So economic competitiveness and performance enhancement seem to be uh, the kind of guiding words of these discussions to such an extent that we have even managed to subsume psychedelics and LSD into this framework of talking about boosting productivity and, and increasing workplace performance. But I think when we talk about human augmentation and superpowers, there might be other perspectives or other things that are relevant for us to consider. So for the purposes of this talk, I would like to say that superpowers, we might define them as the overcoming of our innate limitations, the overcoming of our innate biological limitations or an opportunity not to succumb to the limitations that we are normally exposed to or victims to. But maybe this definition is slightly um, 
incomplete or inadequate because if you have some kind of superpower and you spend your days uh, chilling on the couch and sipping, sipping drinks, then maybe the potential of that superpower remains uh, unexploited or underutilized. So maybe a slightly fuller definition could be that, really not a full definition, but another definition might be that a superpower allows us to overcome our innate limitations in order to do good. It might be slightly cheesy, but I think there is a case to be made for this definition of superpowers. And I guess we can all agree that as humans, we do have limitations aplenty. If we just think of our perceptual uh, apparatus, our perceptual limitations, our senses only pick up so much of the world that is out there. They have a certain spatial and temporal resolution at which they are capable of perceiving what is in the physical world, but that is just a really tiny, thin slice of what, uh, what is really out there. And other entities, other animals, or other artificial systems which come equipped with a different set of sensors can pick up on a different scope or a different set of what is, what is real. Uh, the neuroscientist uh, David Eagleman summarized that quite succinctly by saying that we are so trapped inside our own reality that it is inordinately difficult to realize we are trapped inside anything. But there are some people already who are exploring the ideas and the boundaries, uh, who are already exploring how we might be able to push the boundaries of human perception. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the two artists who are up on the screen, uh, Neil Harbison and Moon Ribas. Neil Harbison is a colorblind artist who was born with a condition called achromatopsia, um, which basically results in him not perceiving any color. So for him, the world is entirely grayscale. But he has an antenna that is implanted surgically attached to the back of his skull. And through that implant, he perceives color information as patterns of, uh, frequent, patterns of sounds. So the camera at the front of this antenna picks up visual information and translates it, encodes it into patterns of auditory frequencies, which he perceives through bone conduction through the back of his skull. And the interesting thing about this, uh, there are many interesting things about this, but I guess one interesting thing is that for him, every color has a very particular and unique sound signature. So he can identify colors at a much finer resolution or at a much higher granularity than the rest of us can. But also, because this camera is sensitive to light in ranges which are beyond what the human eye can perceive, in a certain sense, he has an expanded experience of visual information, although it is for him represented as sound. So his perception of visual information is enriched in a certain sense, but admittedly very different compared to our own. And similarly, um, Moon Ribas, who has an implant in, uh, in her arm, which vibrates whenever there is some tectonic um, activity going on on the planet. So in a way, she is connected to the movements of the Earth in a way that the rest of us are not. And being an artist, she translates those vibrations into a dance, into a dance performance. But moving beyond perceptual limitations, we also have a set of other limitations as well. Um, evolutionary anthropologists have described us as cavemen who are living in a completely hyper-connected and, and utterly complex world to which our minds are maybe not really well uh, adapted. The anthropologist Robin Dunbar, for example, has argued that throughout the history of, uh, of mankind, the majority of that history was spent in small, tight-knit communities of about 150 individuals, and our moral intuitions, our, uh, our ideas about right and wrong, and our attitudes towards in-group and out-group have been shaped uh, under those circumstances. But those circumstances are not really present in our world anymore. We live in, uh, in mega cities of, with millions and millions of people, and our actions and our omissions can have an effect on the world um, far removed from what is our immediate uh, surroundings. And similarly, Daniel Gilbert from Harvard University has argued a few years ago quite forcefully that maybe one of the reasons why we are so incapable to adequately respond to the challenge of global warming is because we just don't come with the kind of cognitive architecture that would allow us to recognize global warming as the, the threat that it is, because it doesn't really tick the kinds of boxes that our brains have evolved 
to, to, focus, to focus on when we are trying to avoid threats. Uh, it is an, an immoral, uh, it is a, a morally neutral phenomenon, global warming. Uh, there is no one that we could point to as being responsible for global warming. It takes place over a very long period of time. So it really has all the features which make it very difficult for us to recognize it and to respond to it adequately. And this is maybe the point where augmented reality and virtual reality and these tools might become really valuable and might prove to be really helpful because they allow us to expand the scope of our thinking, really. That is probably, to my mind, the ultimate promise of virtual reality and augmented reality, that we could step outside the normal cognitive and perceptual um, boundaries that we normally inhabit. But what do we use it for? <laughs> um, oftentimes, we seem to be drawn to using these technologies not to expand our scope of thinking, but rather to create universes around us as individuals and to tailor our perception of reality to our individual preferences. So at a time when we seem to be facing challenges that require us to step outside our cognitive and perceptual horizons, some of the most promising technologies, at least sometimes, seem to be shrinking our horizons instead of, instead of expanding them. So I would like to spend the remainder of the talk uh, by sharing some really promising and exciting um, examples with you where I think that this technology was used as a genuine superpower, allowing us to step outside our confines or our limitations, if you wish. Um, one of these is by a collective called Be Another Lab, which is an international group of uh, researchers and artists and technologists who are basically exploring the use of virtual reality to communicate subjective experience to create spaces where the profound immersion that virtual reality affords us can be used to, to create social bonding and, and social relations instead of, of, of isolation. And in this particular example, you can see a man and a woman who are basically having a, a kind of gender swap experience where the man sees the perspective of the woman and the woman sees the perspective of the man and they go through a sequence of choreographed movements exploring their own body and basically thereby having this, this sort of swap experience, which is really, really interesting, I think. And then another, perhaps my, my all-time favorite, <laughs> is uh, related to the topic of, of biases, and in particular, implicit racial biases, which we know is a very real phenomenon, which know it ha we know it has very real and very negative consequences. Basically, implicit biases are split-second, uh, unconscious, sort of pre-reflective, stereotypical judgments related to race. And we also know that these implicit biases have an effect uh, even in the courtroom. At least from the United States, there, very, there is very strong evidence that black minority men are disproportionately affected by longer sentences and, and a higher rate of guilty charges than their white male counterparts. So, what a researcher called Natalie Solmanovitz at Harvard and a virtual reality company called Spaces have tried to do is to create a de-biasing tool for the courtroom. They are basically proposing and actually proving through a very successful series of experiments is that if someone undergoes an experience where they embody a black avatar and they basically experience themselves as this black avatar, they subsequently score significantly lower on the implicit uh, bias association test. So their implicit racial biases are thereby massively reduced. And consequently, they also make much more fair and equal kinds of judgments in a mock court uh, situation where they have to evaluate ambiguous, uh, ambiguous evidence uh, in a legal case. And I really think that specifically this last example is a kind of superpower that virtual reality, a very clever use of virtual reality affords us because it really allows us to overcome some of the most innate, the most entrenched, and the most difficult to address psychological mechanisms that we as humans have. So as we think about the killer app for virtual reality and the best use case for augmented reality, and we try to carve out a portion of this growing billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry, I think it's also important and, and relevant for us to think about what are the kinds of experiences and what are the kinds 
of, um, of worlds that we want to create and that we want to immerse ourselves and others in. And I think that's my time up. So thank you very much. Thank you.